Welcome tonight. I am so pleased to see each of you here. I know there are many wonderful events in our city and region that you could have been at tonight. Thank you for coming. Um, I don't know if you've ever had any anxiety about throwing a party and wondering if anybody would show up or not. Uh, but I have a certain amount of anxiety about uh, this lecture every year. But this is our ninth annual lecture. And the Lord has been good to us. And we have had some wonderful events in the past nine years. Let me begin with prayer. Thank you, Lord, for what you have done in our lives. Thank you for the opportunity to be here, to celebrate your reviving work, and to be part of what you are doing even today around the world. We ask that you honor us tonight with your presence, and that by your grace, all that we do will be done for the glory of the Father in heaven. And in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So this is our ninth annual Azusa Lecture, named in honor of what is probably the best-known Pentecostal revival this side of Acts chapter 2. And I thank you for being with us tonight, and I thank you for the partners who have helped us to financially make this night available. Why the Azusa Lecture? You've probably heard me tell the story if you've been to one of these or if we've had any kind of conversation at all. On February 22, 1906, an African-American minister by the name of William Joseph Seymour arrived by train in the metropolitan city of Los Angeles. He was convinced that God was pouring out the Holy Spirit in the last days in order to bring about the great harvest before the return of Jesus Christ. He had been invited to come to Los Angeles to serve as pastor of the Santa Fe Holiness Mission. But when he got there and when he preached the message of Pentecost, they said, thanks but no thanks. We don't really want you to be our pastor. When they rejected the message, there were some people in the congregation who had compassion and invited him to preach in their home at 314 North Bonnie Bray Avenue. And Richard Asbury and his wife Ruth invited their neighbors to come and hear this man tell about the Pentecostal message. And they came. But they especially came when Edward Lee on Monday, April the 9th, began to speak in tongues and began to tell about it all throughout the neighborhood. The crowds became so big that they were really too unruly and too many to meet on a residential street. And so they looked for a place to worship. And they found a small wood frame building. It had been used for a lot of different purposes. Even it had been a, a, a Methodist Episcopal church, an African Methodist Episcopal church, had served uh, to house the materials of a carpenter who had really gone unused for a while and they turned it into a place of worship at 312 Azusa Street. The revival spread quickly, and soon people came from all over, even many other parts of the world, to see and hear what was going on there and to seek their own personal Pentecost. The revival there wasn't the first time that God had poured out His Spirit. There are many instances, especially as we seem to come to the end of the 19th century, we could talk about Providence, Rhode Island in 1875, Switzerland in 1879, Delaware, Ohio in 1890, and even in our own tradition, a revival at the Shera Schoolhouse in 1896. But the revival there at Azusa Street was the kind that even our own historian, Dr. Charles W. Kahn, has identified and said is usually regarded as the beginning of the modern Pentecostal movement. Now, historians realize that it's sometimes hard to pinpoint when something began. And it's hard to know what God was doing and what God uh, was at work, where he was around the world. But that revival, which lasted three years, 
made the newspapers. <laughs> and people heard about it. And people went. And they worshipped. Connecting here to Cleveland, two years later, it's 1908, and the pastor of the Cleveland church, this church had been organized about two years, and he had heard about events out at Azusa Street, and he was seeking his own personal experience. So A.J. Tomlinson, the pastor, invited an evangelist by the name of G.B. Cashwell to come here and preach. Tomlinson wrote in his journal, he said, We had been holding tarrying meetings occasionally for several weeks. As the old year was closing and the new coming in, we held a meeting on Pentecostal lines. As near as we could without having the experience ourselves. We were hungry. One had received the baptism and spoke in tongues under my ministry, but that did not satisfy my hungry soul. So he invited G.B. Cashwell, and on January 12, 1908, he preached. The services were held in the exact location, Dr. Beatty, where we'll be having a reception in your honor in just a few minutes at that spot. That's where the original building was at. The presence of the Lord was so great in that service that Tomlinson desiring to seek, got up and started for the altar to pray, but did not make it. He fell to the floor and began speaking in tongues. He later wrote, My mind was clear, but a peculiar power so enveloped and thrilled my whole being that I concluded to yield myself up to God and await results. And those results for Tomlinson were dramatic. It seemed at one point as, as if he were even lifted up off the floor in glory. He said, as I lay there, great joy flooded my soul. The happiest moments I had ever known up to that time. Oh, such floods and billows of glory ran through my whole being. The waves of joy according to his testimony, were followed by a vision. And the Lord took him to every inhabited continent at the time. And as he, in his vision, as he traveled throughout the world, he experienced spiritual warfare. Devils were cast out. People were saved. And he was reminded of the signs following believers in Mark chapter 16. And then his vision returned him to Cleveland, Tennessee. And the Lord asked, will you preach here? in the public square. His life and the life of this congregation were dramatically changed from that point forward. Later that fall, there was a revival, a tent meeting over on Central Avenue, and more than 100 people came into the church. It lasted 10 weeks. Got too cold to have a tent meeting in October. During that time, the local newspaper ran a headline Big holiness meeting, no abatement in interest, enthusiasm, or attendance. According to the account in the paper, the religious fervor of the members and converts is at white heat. The holiness people have practically captured all east and northeast Cleveland, and their strength is materially increasing. The next year, Tomlinson took the message to Indiana, Alabama, Florida, and today we can testify that God is using our movement to reach 179 nations of the world. As a historian, I celebrate that past. Celebrate what God did at Azusa Street. Celebrate what he did here in the history of this congregation. But tonight we're here because we believe that the wind of God is still blowing. The Spirit of God is still at work. And tonight we want to proclaim that work. Now before we hear from Dr. Moore, and I know you've come to hear him and not me, I want us to sing a song. If you don't mind, stand. The song is on the back of your program. It's a song that we don't necessarily sing so much anymore, but we are told that in almost every service at the Azusa Street Mission, they sang, The Comforter Has Come. So I'd like for us to continue that tradition tonight. I've asked Brother Sam, 
Buford Hopkins and Sister Sissy Stovall to help us. Will you join in singing, The Comforter Has Come? We're going to start with the chorus, and then we're going to sing verse 1, verse 4, and verse 5. Let's sing it as though it's a testimony and there were people passing this church that didn't know anything about the Holy Ghost, but let's sing it and proclaim it so they may hear it. It may be the time when somebody will turn their face toward the Lord and experience the, the Comforter. Sing it on, on the chorus. The Comforter has come. The Comforter has come. The blessed Holy Spirit from heaven above, oh, spread the tidings round, wherever man is found, the comforter has come. Oh, spread the tidings round, wherever man is found, wherever human heart and human holes abound. Let every Christian tongue proclaim the joyful sound. The Comforter has come. The Comforter has come. The Comforter has come. The he goes from heaven, the Father's promise given. Oh, spread the tidings round, wherever man is found. The Comforter has come. Oh, boundless love divine, how shall this tongue of mine to wandering mortals tell the matchless grace divine that I, a child of hell, should in his image shine. The comforter has come. See it now. The comforter has come. The Come, the Holy Ghost from heaven, the Father's promise given. Oh, spread the tidings round wherever man is found. The Comforter has come. Sing it to the echoes fly above. The fourth is sky and all the saints above to all below reply in a string of endless love. The song shall never die that the dark of the turn come. The Crown, wherever man is found, oh, that the comforter has come. Thank you for joining with me and countless others who have sung that song in the last hundred years. I'm especially delighted tonight to introduce our speaker, Dr. Ricky Moore. Dr. Moore is an ordained bishop in the Church of God and professor of Old Testament at Lee University, where he also serves as associate dean of Lee's School of Religion. Prior to this appointment, 
He was seven years as chair of Lee's Department of Theology and 25 years on the faculty of the Pentecostal Theological Seminary. Dr. Moore's academic study, his classroom teaching, and his local church ministry are shaped by a deep interest in Old Testament prophecy and its relationship to contemporary Pentecostal theology. Dr. Moore earned the MA and the PhD in Old Testament from Vanderbilt University after completing his bachelor's degree in biblical studies at Lee University. He's the author of God Saves, Lessons from the Elisha Stories, and The Spirit of the Old Testament. He was also a founding editor of the Journal of Pentecostal Theology. Dr. Moore is a member and elder at the Westmore Church of God, where he leads in the area of intergenerational ministry. He and his wife, Jean, who is a registered nurse, have two daughters and two grandsons. I'm proud to say tonight that he has been my teacher, my dean, my department, not my, dean, my department chair, my academic supervisor, more importantly, a mentor and a friend. His presentation tonight is from generation to generation. The call of the word, the cry of the spirit, and the turning of hearts. Would you join me in welcoming Dr. Ricky Moore? I'm doubly honored to be here this evening. First, to be invited to present this year's Azusa Lecture, and second, for it to coincide with Dr. James Beatty being chosen as this year's special honoree. This wonderful man, who first became my teacher many years ago at Lee, has since become one of the most significant spiritual elders in my life, and has been so now for more than a generation of time. So the topic that I've been invited to address here tonight is already enormously represented and alive in the relationship that I have been so deeply blessed to share with Dr. Beatty. So I come before you tonight with great gratitude to James Beatty and to Virginia Beatty, whom I equally honor as a spiritual mother in my life. And to all of you, for coming and being a part of this special occasion. And I also want to express special gratitude to my colleague, Dr. David Roebuck, who set all this up with his usual pitch-perfect planning, perhaps with the exception of this water, which has a picture of a jack-o'-lantern on it. <laughs> but in the spirit of the longer ending of Mark, I'm just going to go ahead and take a drink of it. If we can't handle this, it's not much of a Pentecostal meeting. But also, I'm thankful for David's spiritually discerning gift for helping all of us, year after year, to give rightful honor to our holy heritage and to the Holy Spirit from whom all these blessings flow. Indeed, flow from generation to generation. As Dr. Roebuck well knew when he first approached me about presenting something on this intergenerational theme, this has been a prime theme for me for a very long time. That's one of the reasons why my lecture title is so long. Regardless of how I might name it, I have long been captured by the theme, the message, the burden, the longing, the lifelong calling, to turn the hearts of the elders to their children and the hearts of the children to their elders. I remember when this calling first consciously gripped me. I was in a classroom in our Church of God College near San Juan, Puerto Rico, having been invited there to teach a course one summer in the mid-1980s. It was a time in my life when I had recently become a father when I had only just started teaching at our seminary here and had just taken up a ministry role in my local church that had thrust me into the midst of my first real gut-wrenching, first-hand encounter 
with church conflict, leadership conflict, and a division that had an intergenerational dimension to it, as I have since learned that most of them always do. As I was teaching those Puerto Rican students about Moses teaching the children of Israel, with passions rising up in me that I'm sure were being stoked more than I would have realized at the time by the pain of my own congregational struggle, one of the students interrupted me mid-sentence, raising his hand and saying through the translator, Dr. Moore, what I'm seeing and what you are saying is what God said through the prophet Malachi. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the land with a curse. When my student spoke these words, I remember there was a gust of wind that blew through the open windows of the room right at that moment, the kind of breeze that blew loose papers off our desks and onto the floor. The memory of the sound of that wind coming into the room that day where we were all gathered and the feeling of it as it brushed my face and swept across my skin has never left me. And I look back on that very moment after all these years and I know as deeply as I know anything that the breath of God came upon my body that day as the word of God came into my heart in a turning point and life-defining way. And that awareness has never left me from that day until this night. What I want to share here tonight are a few of the things that I've seen along the way from that day until this night. Things that have expanded and deepened that awareness and made it as vital and as fresh to me as ever. And I hope to do this in a way that could be meaningful to all of you as well. Sometime not long after the event I just described, I was asked by one of our church's executive leaders to write up a statement on our denomination's, on our denomination's foundational doctrinal commitment to the whole Bible rightly divided. This executive leader had been scheduled to present a position paper on this topic, and he was asking me to assist him. I struggled over how to respond, not having any interest in being a ghostwriter. But when my mind began to push against this request from my elder, I soon realized that God was pushing on my heart. And what soon came out was a paper, which probably wasn't very helpful as a position paper, but it was enormously helpful to me, for it was the paper where I believe I first discovered my voice as a son of this church, a son who was being called to become a father in this household of faith. And now I'm going to read an excerpt a somewhat lengthy excerpt of what I then said, which captures the call of the word portion of my lecture here tonight. The first teaching of the Church of God as recorded in the denomination's official minutes reads, the Church of God stands for the whole Bible rightly divided. The New Testament is the only rule for government and discipline, end quote. The first statement in this teaching is drawn directly from Paul's word to young Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a worker that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The second statement in our teaching is not drawn directly from any scripture. In fact, our statement on the New Testament as the only rule for government and discipline clashes in a troublesome way with what Paul writes Timothy in the very next chapter. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction or discipline, as the New English Bible translates it, in righteousness. As someone who had been called specifically to study and to teach Old Testament scripture in the Church of God, I, I have found this clash between Paul's statement, all scripture is profitable for discipline, and our statement, the New Testament is the only rule for government and discipline, 
to be a very difficult problem for this young workman. I wrote that because I was a young man then. And I continued to write as follows. I found this difficult problem not unrelated to an earlier, even more profound problem, which I had with the whole Bible rightly divided. Let me tell you a little about how my struggle with the Word of God unfolded. I came out of my Vanderbilt Old Testament graduate program a very withered soul. There I learned to survive among teachers who conveyed almost nothing of the faith which Paul had in God's Word, nor the spiritual devotion which he had for his students. Even as I had no Paul in the university, in the church I found no Paul. That is, some elder who superintended my calling with passion, discernment, and godly authority. Although I'm sure I would have confessed at any point along the way that I believed in the whole Bible rightly divided, the deepest commitments of my heart were becoming wrongly divided, and they were taking me further and further from any real operative authority of God's Word in my life. The Bible, whether at church or at the university, became more and more a passive object of study and less and less a medium of God's living voice. Bible study became more and more a self-serving career and less and less a corporately attested calling. No elder such as Paul was to Timothy ever confronted these, these crucial issues in me. Not until I met Steve Land at the 1980 Church of God General Assembly. He spoke to me of his scholarship as a sacred trust and ministry which belonged to the church. This was a word unfamiliar to my ears, but it was a word of God to this young Timothy, and it threw an uncomfortable shaft of light upon my divided heart. And then I continued and wrote this. I want to lift up a crucial revelation about the authority of God's word in the church that I find right here. The authority of God's word in the church is closely tied to the ministry of godly elders in the church. I believe that Paul's doctrine of scripture will always lose any real meaning and effect in the church wherever Paul's pattern of genuine eldering ministry is curtailed. I do not believe it coincidental that such an explicit word on the authority of scripture 2 Timothy 3.16 comes to us in a letter which so clearly manifests the loving godly authority of an elder to his spiritual son. Paul repeatedly emphasizes in the epistle how the revelation of God's word depends upon faithful transmission through godly elders. Through Timothy's grandmother Lois and mother Eunice 1.6, through Paul when he tells Timothy to, quote, hold fast the pattern of sound words which you've heard through me, 113. Through Timothy as well as Paul when the apostle says, quote, the things which you have heard from me among many witnesses commit the same to faithful persons. And through these same faithful persons, quote, who shall be able to teach others also. The authority of scripture is lifted high by Paul precisely in the context of the vital ministry of elders. Indeed, Paul's classic statement that all scripture is inspired is prefaced with these words. Continue in the things which you have learned and have been assured of, knowing of whom you learned them, and that from a child you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. The implications of this connection between knowing elders and knowing the Holy Scriptures should be clear to us. The truth of Paul will become empty and null where the eldering love like Paul's is lost, no matter how high we pitch our creedal statements about Scripture. I believe that I and multiplied thousands in my generation have experienced the living proof that this is true. I went on in the paper to say the following. 
it would be difficult to describe what I have come to see and to confess about the whole Bible rightly divided. It is nothing less than my entire testimony of joy and pain and victory and struggle before the Word of God in the context of chosen relationships with wonderful elders like Ernest Moore, Doris Moore, Steve Land, Bob Crick, and David Daner, with precious sisters and brothers like Buell Moore, Bedford Smith, Steve McCuller, Jackie Johns, Cheryl Johns, Chris Thomas, Rick Waldrop, Philip Morris, and Marcia Anderson, and with wonderful students too numerous to mention, and with beloved companions like Jean, Emily, and Hannah. I mention these names even though they may not have much to do with a position paper, and now a lecture. Perhaps I'm not too far from why Paul did not write Timothy, a position paper. He had lots of names to mention. And if you took all the names out of 2 Timothy, I'm not sure how much of the doctrine of Scripture, as Paul himself understood it, would be left. Indeed, I have come to believe that what was at stake here for Paul and what is now at stake for, for our doctrine of Scripture is nothing less than the Word's essential relation to the activity of the Holy Spirit, who has sovereignly chosen to include the names, who lives and moves and reveals the Word of God precisely among those named, through those named, and in those named. Lose sight of the names and the specific relationships and activities which they entail, and you lose sight of the activity of the Holy Spirit, without which you lose sight of the Word of God. The paper came to a conclusion with these words. We are tempted to quench the Spirit, just like Israel was tempted to silence the prophet. But neither Israel's preserving the book of the Torah in the temple, as in Josiah's day, nor our preserving of Scripture in our declaration of faith will preserve the centrality of the Word among us when we quench or ignore the living operation of the Spirit. And we will do this if we curtail the testimonies of the Spirit's work among God's people, or if we disregard the particular manifestations of the Spirit's activity from the least to the greatest, or if we replace the Spirit's bonds of love between elders and children with impersonal institutional relationships. We will end up thinking that we really embrace the Word of God, but it will be a far cry from the embrace which Paul shared with Timothy. Yes, a far cry, which brings me to my second part of my lecture here tonight. For that far cry I have come to see is ultimately nothing other than the cry of the Spirit. For me, this insight was born out of a number of years of walking out the call of the Word that I have just described and the necessary burden and struggle that came with it. But it finally came into full focus for me not too long ago after I became a grandfather. I was invited to give the keynote address at the 2010 Society for Pentecostal Studies meeting, an invitation that came at a time in my life when the load of my duties as an administrator had weighed me down to the point that I felt I didn't have much ministry left in me. Ironically, answering the call to administer academic programs for the students of Lee had brought me to what seemed like the end of my capacity to be a minister to all these sons and daughters around me. But as I picked my brain about what I could say at this most significant speaking opportunity I'd, I'd ever been offered, the Holy Spirit, as near as I can tell, began to prick my heart. And what came out was another paper, and had, it had this title, New Visions, New Voices, The Promise of the Father. to a grandfather's cry. And now I'm going to read you another excerpt from that paper, which will elaborate the cry of the spirit part of my lecture here tonight. As Pentecostals steeped in the language of Luke Acts, 
we know this phrase, the promise of the Father, to be a Lucan reference to the gift of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that arrived on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. We first hear this phrase in the last chapter of Luke, where Jesus, in his last words to his disciple before his ascension, announces, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. We hear this phrase again in the first chapter of Acts, when Luke recalls Jesus' final instruction to his disciples. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father which, he said, you have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. As a father myself, I've been musing a lot lately on the parental implications of this reference, the promise of the Father. I've been especially occupied with such musing since the 31st of last May when I became a grandfather. It just so happens that this was Pentecost Sunday, no lie. And would you believe that my first grandchild, Evan Joseph Young, made his advent into this world at the officially recorded time of 9.03 in the morning, which I believe is what Peter in Acts 2 calls the third hour of the day. I always thought the Lord was just kind of throwing me a bone with that one. I share this with you not only to go out of my way to shamelessly include a reference to my new grandson, but also to tip my hand here at the outset as to the hopeless particularity and bias of my contextual hermeneutic. Yes, I confess this is where I'm coming from, but please let me tell you what I've seen and heard coming to the Pente Pentecost text from this grandfatherly vantage point. We all know that the gift of the Holy Spirit in Acts was imparted to make witnesses of God's people, according to the programmatic text of Acts 1.8. A witness sees something and speaks something. Something is beheld and something is told. As with the theme of the meeting, it's about visions and voices. As Peter proclaims this Acts 2 message, this Jesus God has raised up of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. The promise of the Holy Spirit thus has this juridical or judicial function to make us witnesses. Witnesses in the court of public opinion and before the throne of God where Jesus is exalted. But why then should this impartation of the Holy Spirit be called the promise of of the Father and not the promise of the Lord or God or the judge of all the earth. I would suggest it's because God here is doing not only something judicial but also and especially something parental. It appears to me that Peter focuses in on this when he comes down to the last recorded words of his Pentecost message, his altar call, if you will, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for this promise is for you and to your children and to all who are afar off as many as the Lord our God will call. God is a parent, indeed the ultimate and grandest parent who is bestowing a gift that is meant to come down as a blessing upon his people, like the parental blessing featured so prominently in the covenant of the Old Testament. This is the endowment, the inheritance, that will course down from parents to their children, to their children's children, and beyond. This is the promise of the Heavenly Father that is meant to be taken up and passed down through every earthly father and mother. This whole notion of an inheritance of spirit being passed through parent to child can remind us of Elisha's appeal to Elijah for a double portion of his spirit in 2 Kings 2. In the Old Testament covenant, the double portion designates that measure of the patrilineal inheritance reserved for the oldest son. Property and land were typically divided among the sons of a family 
in equal portions except for a double portion that went to the oldest. Elisha is a spiritual son of the prophet Elijah, the one he calls my father, and he looks to his spiritual father with longing for an inheritance that transcends physical property. Like in Acts 2, an inheritance of spirit is the issue. Yet spirit is something that goes beyond a parent's capacity to apportion and bestow. Elijah realizes when it comes to transferring a double portion of spirit that he just can't cut it. So he tells his spiritual son, you've asked a difficult thing. Elijah expresses something here that I suspect might be vital for every spiritual parent to realize. This crucial matter of passing of spiritual inheritance to our children is a difficult thing. So exceedingly difficult that it just might point us and push us to the end of ourselves, even beyond the end, as with Elijah, of all we can do, regardless of the level of our spiritual maturity, our ministerial ability, or our theological training. Nevertheless, Elijah seems to know something, even though there appears no earthly way to bestow this inheritance of spirit, that there is still hope for this inheritance to be endued from on high. And not unlike what we see in Acts 2, there is a manifested encounter at this critical juncture for Elijah and Elisha, wind that comes down from heaven and transacts this endowment that goes beyond what is possible for any parent on earth. This is indeed the promise of the Father from on high. This is right in line with the miraculous intergenerational work of the Spirit that is featured and highlighted from the very beginning of Luke's Gospel. In Luke's first two chapters, wherever we see the Holy Spirit, we see a powerful connecting force moving on persons across generational lines. We see this first when Zacharias receives the promise of a son who will be filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. It's a spiritual endowment that is immediately linked to that of Elijah. In the spirit and power of Elijah, this son to be named John will turn the hearts of elders to their children, echoing the canon concluding prophecy of the book of Malachi. The spirit is coming not merely to empower individuals, but to restore a connection that has been broken for an entire people. A lineage between elders and children through which the endowment of the Spirit can again wondrously flow. From this point, Luke's Gospel promptly proceeds to narrate the ways in which the Holy Spirit begins to work in and around John to fulfill this promise and accomplish this effect. Even while John is still literally in his mother's womb, we see the Holy Spirit restoring this linkage between elders and children in multiple ways. In Zacharias receiving the promise of the Spirit for the destiny of his son. In Elizabeth in her old age being filled with this son who is filled with the Spirit. In Mary being told of her impregnation by the Holy Spirit in a revelation that immediately prompts her to go to her elder Elizabeth. And in these two women coming together, young generation and old, each bearing through the Holy Spirit the seed of the next generation, coming together in a moment that totally explodes with the overflowing revelation of the Spirit's intergenerational work of filling the physical lineage of a people with a spiritual inheritance. It's a prophetic moment when these two women from two different generations come together. One, I would suggest that long before the day of Pentecost begins to inaugurate the fulfillment of the intergenerational promise of Joel 2.28. A son prophesies through a sign action of leaping in the womb of his mother, who is herself then immediately filled with the Holy Spirit. A daughter prophesies a magnificat of praise for God's blessing upon her, quote, his maidservant, who will be acknowledged henceforth by all generations and for God's, quote, mercy upon all who fear him from generation to generation. Indeed, a maidservant prophesies of how God has helped his servant Israel 
as he had, had promised to our fathers, to Abraham, to his seed forever. Thus, this moment of the physical convergence of three generations, Elizabeth, Mary, and their unborn children, becomes a moment that represents and reveals the spiritual convergence and connecting of generations, including and extending far beyond these three, all the way back to Abraham and all the way forward to all who will come from his seed throughout all of time to come. And Luke's gospel doesn't stop there, but goes on to describe subsequent moments that similarly represent and reveal the same kind of intergenerational work of the Spirit. We see this when John is brought for circumcision and his father Zacharias in the solemn moment of recording his son's name is filled with the Holy Spirit and begins to prophesy of his son's def destiny. When Mary and Joseph bring the infant Jesus into the temple before the old man Simeon who had been led there by the Spirit at this very moment, the text notes, whereupon he prophesies of the destiny of the Holy Child. We see in these spirit-charged moments of child dedication the fulfillment not only of old men's dreams, but also the dream of an old woman, Anna, the prophetess who had been among those looking, the text says, for the redemption in Jerusalem. If we step back and sum up this movement of the spirit at the beginning of Luke's gospel, we indeed see from the birth announcement of John forward the hearts of elders being turned to children. We see the Holy Spirit powerfully moving and filling elders around the events of these children's birth and dedications, giving them visions and prophecies that illuminate the spirit-endowed destinies of these children and the spiritual inheritance that all this bears and promises for all generations to come. All of this surely and rightfully can be described as the first fruits of the promise, indeed the promise of the Father. Thus I would say this movement of the Spirit in the first two chapters of Luke cannot help but illuminate in this regard the movement of the Spirit in the first two chapters of Acts, where we see a much larger group of elders being filled with the Spirit and given inspired promises concerning their sons and daughters and the spiritual inheritance that this outpouring of the Spirit in Acts. We all know that Acts is concerned to see the outpouring of the Spirit issuing forth geographically through ever-widening regions of space, but I think we have not given sufficient attention to the concern in Acts to see the outpouring of the Spirit issuing forth temporally through future generations in time and not just the generations of Abraham's biological children. Peter ends his message in Acts 2 by widening the circle to as many as the Lord our God shall call. But near the beginning, he quotes Joel's way of widening the circle in the reference to whoever calls on the name of the Lord. Now in Luke Acts, the gift of the Spirit, the promise of the Father, clearly comes to people that the Lord is calling. Zacharias, Elizabeth, Mary, Simeon, the disciples. But on the other hand, although it might not be as pronounced in the narrative, there are at least some hints that the Father of the promise is calling to people who are already calling to him. The angel said to Zacharias, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. Elizabeth, after she conceives, makes a statement that at least indirectly indicates her perception that God is responding to what had been a long-standing cry of her soul. Thus says the Lord, she said. Thus the Lord has dealt with me, she says, in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. Simeon is introduced as an old man who had been waiting for the consolation of Israel. This is the kind of language that presupposes a context of grief and lament. Lament not just of Simeon, but in some sense of the entire people of Israel. 
Similarly, Anna is described as serving in the temple with fastings and prayers night and day among those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. This is not at all unlike the disciples in Acts 1 who carry out the instruction not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. After the disciples returned to Jerusalem, they all continued, we are told, with one accord in prayer and supplication. Taking all of this together, there is at least some basis for the perception that the promise of the Father in Luke Acts is coming in answer to calls or cries that are already being taken up and lifted up before God's notice by a number of elders in Israel. I'm not wanting to make too much of this aggregate of prayers, supplications, and tearings as a causative or precipitating factor in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Luke Acts. The accent of Luke's narrative itself seems to be much more tilted toward God as the initiating cause. Yet I also don't want to make too little of these human longings and cries that keep surfacing along the way in the narrative. It's no doubt the case that the divine call is ever dialectically related to the human call, calling it forth as well as responding to it. Deep calls to deep at the noise of your waterfalls, your waves and billows rolling over me, the psalmist says to God in Psalm 42. In a psalm where the psalmist is clearly struggling to grasp his own deep cry, why are you downcast, O my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? Perhaps we should see the outpouring of the Spirit in Luke Acts playing something of the role of the waterfalls and billows of the deep in this psalm, calling forth the human self's deepest cries, even sighs too deep for words. For as Paul declares, the Spirit searches all things, indeed the deep things of God. I'm suggesting then that in the background of the unfolding account of the coming of, of the Holy Spirit in Luke Acts, there is a human cry more particularly a parental cry that is calling forth and no doubt being called forth by the promise of the Father. And this suggestion is significantly strengthened, I believe, by the book of Joel, which is explicitly cited in Luke Acts as background text to the event of the outpouring of the Spirit. Joel's prophecy begins by focusing extensively on the human cry that comes before the promise of the Holy Spirit. Even as Luke Acts expands the foreground of the divine promise, Joel elaborates the background of the human cry. So when Peter says on the day of Pentecost, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, it's an invitation to see not only Joel's identification of the promise of the Father, but also Joel's concentration on the underlying cry of the people. Joel's message begins with a call to lament, which is the most intensive and extensive such call in all of Scripture. In chapter 1, he uses every conceivable word for lament in Hebrew vocabulary. In Joel 2, this call to cry intensifies and escalates up to the breaking point the command to rend your heart and not your garments. This call brings us to the end of ourselves, for this is a command to do what we are not capable of doing, because rending our heart is quite plainly and finally our undoing. When I came to this point in my paper, in March of 2010, I did not know quite how to finish. Just as I have struggled to find the right way to bring my lecture to an end here tonight, what I did then was to share a story of how my cry as a father had first been surfaced in me around the time that my daughter Hannah had first begun her own journey 
down a difficult life path, a difficult diagnosis, a path mar marked by her own pain and cry. I decided that tonight was not the right night to tell you the story about my cry, but to let Hannah tell you her story about her cry. It's in the form of a brief three-page homily that she wrote for and delivered at her church, the New Covenant Church of God, a few evenings ago, never expecting at that time that her father would ask her to read it here tonight. But she's graciously agreed, and so now I'm turning it over to her to conclude my part, because I know of no better way to bear the message of the third and final part of my lecture, the turning of hearts. Readings from Romans chapter 4, verses 18 through 21. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed, and so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. I think a lot about the promises of God these days, maybe many of us do, and all through the process of writing this reflection, I wondered how honest do I want to be as I revisit my own experience with these promises, and as tempting as it is to make everything sound lovely and nice, I've decided that I cannot sit here before you like this without being real. So at the risk that this is going to probably end up more like a testimony than a homily, here goes. My closest friends and family already know this, and they have been faithful to walk through it with me. But the painful truth is for a while now, I've been in full-on combat with depression. Some of the worst I've ever seen, in fact. Over the past year and a half, as the darkness keeps getting darker, I've spent a lot of time and energy trying to figure out why. Even though I know I should know better, my brain keeps insisting. Maybe if I understood it, I could fix it, and then I would get well. On the surface, it should be easy to identify why I am depressed. I think partly the relentless pain and disease in my body is simply taking its toll on my heart and mind. 
But there's something else, something deeper. Probably like many of us in this room here tonight, I am waiting on the fulfillment of a promise from God. And yes, I try very hard not to insist that the fulfillment must look a certain way. And I do not pretend to understand the specifics of what God has in mind. But I do know this much. These promises go beyond anything I would ever dare to ask for. Truthfully, I think much of my depression can be attributed to the sheer mismatch between the wholeness God has promised, in whatever form that may come in, versus the profound brokenness I face every single minute of every single day. More times than I can count, I have asked God, does he wish for me to let go of the promise? After all, perhaps it wasn't even from him. Maybe my vain imaginations are to blame, and those of the well-intentioned people who love me so well. Anyone, especially me, could have misinterpreted. And even if the promise is true, I've followed Christ long enough to realize. Sometimes he requires us to place that which we treasure most on the altar before him. And so again I pose a question. Does he wish for me? to place this promise on the altar? To the second question, I believe the answer is yes, because he wants me to die to my own ideas of what fulfillment of the promise should look like. In time, God may even call me to return to the altar and take up the promise once more but I must hold it very gently without grabbing or grasping. But back to my first question, does God wish for me to let go of the promise altogether? This is how I would answer. Often I meditate on what the term faith means. Sure, Hebrews 11.1 1 tells us Faith is the evidence of things not seen, the substance of things hoped for. But what does that actually look like? For a long time, like many Pentecostals, I tended to see faith as some mysterious, powerful force. And if I could muster up enough of it, something miraculous would happen. But slowly I am learning there is more, so much more, to faith than this. For one, faith is not a force to be mustered up so that something big will happen. On the contrary, I am beginning to see faith is that which somehow holds on to God and what he has promised even when, especially when, nothing big happens and you're left just trying to make it the best you can, wading through the pain and the tears and the nitty-gritty of daily living. Some in our helplessly earthbound culture might think it's easy to cherish a crazy dream like this one. The harder thing, they say, is to knuckle down and do the real work of accepting things as they are. But I see it very differently. For me, it's actually much harder to hold on to the promise because everything my entire present reality shouts the contrary. 
Just a few weeks ago, I received yet another troubling medical diagnosis, and I won't try to use pretty words. It was like getting smashed in the gut by a heavyweight boxer. So once again, I asked the Lord, do you want me to let go of the promise? Perhaps I've discerned it all wrong up until now. Maybe this is just your final signal that I really should let it go. Yet still, the still small voice in my heart said differently. I would have let go of the promise, but the promise and the one who made it would not let go of me. Not even when everything around me screams, and believe me, it screams louder than you can imagine that the promise cannot possibly be true. Upon reflection, maybe that's a bit of what the Apostle Paul meant in the scripture text that I just read when he wrote about Abraham hoping against hope. Can you imagine how Abraham and Sarah felt after God made the promise and time kept passing Year after year after year, their bodies got older and frailer, yet still the hoped for child did not come. They may have come very near to forsaking the promise. I'm not sure, but I would venture a guess. I imagine Abraham laid the promise on the altar many times. Even before his son was born, God may have been preparing Abraham for when he would literally lay the very realization of that promise, Isaac himself, on the altar. But yet, Scripture tells us Abraham did not give up not even when he got so old that he knew his body was as good as dead. Indeed, Abraham did not let go of the promise. He may have faltered along the way, but he didn't let go. And neither did God. After all, wasn't he the one who strengthened Abraham in his faith? So perhaps I shouldn't let go either. Literally every breath that I take is a statement of faith. I choose to live and I choose to believe that God is doing and will do what he has promised. In closing, I will say this. I often worry that my holding on to a promise for the future will impede my ability to serve God in the present. But I'm coming to realize, perhaps in some way, my holding on to this promise for the future is part of my serving God in the present. To bear witness as one who walks daily in the tension between the already and the not yet. For me, that is faith.
Thank you, Ricky, for challenging us, for reminding us of the word, for reminding us of the connectivity that the Spirit gives to those who have come before, to those who have yet to come. Thank you, Hannah. You've convicted us. Thank you for your presence among us, for the testimony of your presence. Perhaps you've inspired all of us to hold on to those promises that the Father has made to us tonight. I am reminded again, I see Mary Fisher. Thank you, Sister Fisher, for being with us. This Azusa lecture really emerged in conversation with Dr. Robert Fisher. I was so blessed to work with him and privileged to learn from him. And we talked about how that as the world looked forward to celebrating the centennial of the Azusa street mission and revival that we might do some small part here in Cleveland and bring to our community a gift that comes out of our tradition and out of our heritage. And in doing so, we realized that tonight would be a wonderful opportunity to honor and to pay tribute to someone among us who perhaps reminds us of the continuing work that God did then and is doing now. And so we developed what we call the Spirit of Azusa Award. There are many characteristics that we could talk about. We could talk about someone with an emphasis on the Word, an emphasis on the ongoing work of the Spirit, an emphasis on and commitment to raising up young ministers and young leaders, a commitment to the global harvest. And so tonight we want to honor one such person. And uh, this person has been my mentor for a long time. And the mentor of many of you here. How many people in this room have ever taken a course with James Beatty? Quite a few. He likes to brag that he taught my father and then he taught me. But there is one among us, a friend who goes back with Dr. Beatty even further than I do. And I wanted to invite him to help me this evening. Dr. David Ramirez is the director of Church of God Ministries in Latin America, a member of the Church of God International Executive Council, and a son of James Beatty. And I invite him to join me tonight in honoring our mentor and father in the Lord. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Robert, for this wonderful initiative, and thank you so much for this moment that we are living, and uh, I, I think that we will have to uh, uh, be silent all night long just to process everything that we have been hearing tonight. What a privilege and uh, a great opportunity to, to uh, honor Dr. Beatty and Virginia and uh, their whole family. You know, I know Dr. Beatty, for 52 years, believe it or not, that doesn't make me old or too old, but I was very young when I met him. When they came to Chile, Santiago, Chile, uh, you know, in 1962, 63, I was only five years of age. But I remember very well when this missionary couple came uh, with this blue eyes, blonde hair, beautiful couple, uh, learning and speaking already uh, Spanish, they, they, they already, you know, you, you can speak to them in Spanish, in Creole, in French, in Koine Greek, uh, even German, I think that they will understand most languages. So they do 
uh, and they are a very good uh, Azusa uh, spirit. Uh, they represent the spirit of Azusa because they know the languages of the people. And uh, I will not take time tonight to uh, mention to you his biography because you can find that you can find, you know, their journey in so many places, and even in the program you have some of that. But in just two or three minutes, I would like to mention to you some of the legacy uh, that I have uh, learned from his ministry and life that have shaped my life, and uh, probably will help all of us to uh, make sure that uh, we finish our journey well. And uh, I, I will say that Dr. Jane Berry, one of those persons that can teach us and mentor in us how to finish well. Um, to finish well, I will say, and that's something that I have learned from him, uh, we must start now. Uh, the whole journey is important. And I remember, you know, 52 years ago when I met them and been following them since then, uh, have been a tremendous journey um, with uh, mountain experiences and valley experiences and knowing them in, in a very intimate way at uh, their son, spiritual son and following their advice but in, throughout the whole journey uh, witnessed a tremendous and very strong Christian testimony. I tell many people all the time that if I know a true Christian is Dr. James Beatty, and it's a, it's a, for me it's a very uh, true statement. I have not uh, seen uh, any other that a person that represents the kingdom values in 24-7. And uh, he, of course, he's a human, and uh, he, I, I'm sure that the people, many of us that know him well, know that he has his moment and he, you know, he's have, uh, he has his character. But uh, uh, at the end of the day, he uh, continued living that life. Secondly, to finish well, you must finish the last chapter well. And uh, you follow his journey and study his biography. Every, every uh, task that he did, uh, he finished that task very well. Um, you, you, uh, I can follow him since his missionary experience from Chile as he was a missionary uh, superintendent for South America and then see how he uh, came uh, back to uh, Cleveland uh, and could make a tremendous contribution at Lee and, and then uh, his wonderful uh, vision to start this Houston Hispanic Institute of Ministry in Houston, Texas from uh, an institution that formed me, and I was there as a student, and see how he uh, uh, dedicated his life developing people, more than buildings or uh, structures, but building people. To finish well, you must have a perspective from the end. It seemed to be that he knew where he was going. It seemed to be that somehow the Holy Spirit indicated him what was the direction and he taught us that. Dr. Berry taught us that to finish well depends on relationship we leave behind. And um, uh, I don't know any enemies of Dr. Berry's. Uh, probably adversaries or people that have different opinion, but enemies. Uh, I think that he has been taking care of, uh, of the relationship quite well. And uh, that is an example for us to finish well we need to love people, and we need to accept people as they are. He taught us to prioritize what is important. God kingdom first. And he have teaches us, um, taught us that through his style of life, his daily life. To finish well, we need to provide unconditional forgiveness. And that's something that I have witnessed in Dr. Beatty throughout his uh, ministry and his life. He taught us that to finish well does not mean to satisfy all our desires. And uh, that is so important. Uh, what a lesson. You don't have to have everything to be happy and to be whole. Uh, it seems to be that uh, in our shame, we also find hope. And that uh, was a tremendous uh, lesson uh, that we received from him. 
To finish well means to abandon and continue the journey. And uh, finally, he taught us that to finish well is the only important thing at the end. And when you see, you know, and read Paul's words to, second, to Timothy, his spiritual son, when he said, for I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearance. So, Dr. David Robach, I don't think that we can uh, think in another person that represents the spirit of Azusa, and I want to congratulate the people that choose Dr. James Bailey to be the recipient of this award. Thank you, Dr. Merez. Dr. Beatty, if you and Sister Beatty want to come. With Dr. Ramirez's help, and Dr. Beatty, we might not have been able to have done this uh, with the blessings of our budget lately, but I asked several people to help us, and it's amazing how much people in this room love you and have shown their care and love for you. So with hearts full of thanksgiving for how you have mentored us and countless others around the world, we present to you tonight the Spirit of Azusa Award presented to James M. Beatty, October 28, 2014. And in addition to this commemorative flame, we have an envelope with a financial gift. And we'd also like to present to you the painting that David Bishop did. It's signed and numbered, uh, representing the Azusa revival. He did it on the centennial uh, in 2006, and it's called Heaven Came Down. And we present these gifts to you with love, appreciation, and admiration. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. It's a great honor. <clears throat> it's a great honor that has been bestowed upon me today, and I thank uh, David, Dr. Roebuck for arranging it, and Dr. Ramirez for participating, and every, all of you for being here. <clears throat> I have a few things to say, but I first of all, I'd like to say, have my family stand my son and his family, Mark Beatty and his wife, Jamie Petrie Beatty, and their son, uh, Isaiah James Beatty, and their daughter, Carmen Camille Beatty. And her parents are with us, and they're a family. And I have a niece that came up from Atlanta, my youngest sister, who was born in January of 45 before I graduated from college in May or June, whenever it was that year. Lisa Hughes, Ed Hughes, and Clark Hughes, they come up to join it with us. And we're glad to have our family with you. God bless you. Often when I have done something for someone, they say, how can I pay you back? I said, that's not the point. The point is passing it on. I said, I've already had this done to me. The Lord has been good to me. People have blessed me. And so it's a matter of passing it on. And this is what our message was about tonight. Our, by Dr. Moore, From generation to generation, we pass it on. And I would like to uh, 
say something about the people who have helped me. I thank each of you who have come here tonight and have participated in this event to honor what God has done in and through my life. It is with a heart full of gratitude that I acknowledge the grace and the power of God which has worked in me and through me to be a blessing to others. I also acknowledge the impact of so many others that have, that have been a blessing to on my life in so many different ways. So I'm going back and touch a lot of people who have blessed me over the years. First and foremost, I thank God for the gift of his son, Jesus Christ, who is now my Lord and my Savior. The Lord found me in a very special meaning of that word, those words on April 14th, 1940, after I had turned 15 on January 30 of that year. So often we say we found the Lord, but the truth is I was not looking for the Lord. He was looking for me. I was a sheep that was lost. He was the good shepherd who had given his life for me and who was in, to use the language of the poet, was the hound of heaven who was searching for me. The little church building across the railroad tracks in the woods was rustic, no interior finish and no paint, inside or out except this, for the sign which read Church of God with the word the over the middle of it, on top of it. The congregation was small, 17 members, and the pastor was Sister Ida Parrish. My friend Charles Harrell, all those, everyone called him Junior, he was a, a few months older than I was, and he was a high school dropout at that point. I was in the ninth grade. And we were both from families in which there was not a single person who was converted. We had come from the, for the young people's service that night, which was about 6 o'clock. And when that was over, we went back and stood in the middle of the railroad tracks, the Atlantic Coastline Railroad tracks, wondering what to do and decided to go back for the church service. What I remember about the church service that night was the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. It felt like a ton of bricks was on my shoulders. And I knew without a shadow of a doubt that I was lost. And that the only thing keeping me out of hell was the breath of life. When the altar call was given, Junior and I went forward. I had no idea what I should say, but in my way, I prayed and asked God for, the, for forgiveness, and all of a sudden it happened. The burden was lifted, and I knew that I was forgiven. I knew that God was my Father, that Christ was my Savior and Lord. There was joy unspeakable, and my heart was running over with thanks and praise. My countenance changed, and someone praying for me said, Believe the Lord, and He will sanctify you. I knew absolutely nothing about that, but I prayed and asked the Lord to sanctify me. I had no additional specific sensation that I could pinpoint as an experience of sanctification, but I felt like the Lord had saved me and had sanctified me, whatever that meant. When we were through praying, Sister Perry said, Boys, tell us what the Lord has done for you. And I said, I thank God that he has saved me and sanctified me. And continue with something like this. I want to be faithful to the end. Pray for me. When we had finished, Sister Parrish said to the few people who were gathered there that night, Folks, we're going to have services this night, this, every night this week so that these two young men can be baptized in the Holy Spirit. I went home a different person that night. The next day, of course, was school day, and I was in, this, in school. But that night, after singing and preaching, Junior and I were in the altar, again, seeking to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday nights were about the same. But on Thursday night, I found myself 
on the right hand side looking forward from the toward the front on the floor on the flat of my back and all of a sudden I began speaking in tongues and this continued for several minutes and then there was a change of language I knew because it sounded completely different and this ha this repeated itself four or five times what happened that night changed my life forever the Holy Spirit has always been there through thick and thin and has given me strength to face every difficulty and every problem and I still pray in tongues almost every night I owe a debt of gratitude to so many people who have emptied part of themselves into me in all these years my father and my mother of course my teachers in the public school system sister Parrish, my first pastor who gave me counsel counsel advice and also gave me old evangels to read and there were other members like sister Manthe Moore who worked with the young people and brother Johnny Hales who was the volunteer maintenance man who built the fire in the pot bellied stove when that was needed who kept kerosene in the two Aladdin lamps who trimmed the weeks, wicks and replaced the mantles as needed who kept the place tidied up and who nailed more tar paper on the roof when the storm a storm would blow off some of it off I'm also indebted to the teachers who have poured them their time and their gifts into my life beginning with the one room school at a little community community called Corbett Hatcher in Johnston County North Carolina that's where I began school then in the Selma Elementary School the Smithfield Elementary School and the Smithfield High School then at Atlantic Christian College in Wilson North Carolina where Mr. Waters guided me through the laws concerning the draft in World War II and first steered me to Vanderbilt where John Dean John T. Benton who was gracious in helping me with scholarships and even took care of an operation on my eye ten years later after finishing seminary I came back in 1959 to do the PhD I am specially indebted to Dr. Leander Keck under whom I did my thesis and Rabbi Lou Silberman with whom I took several courses in Jewish studies and who was on my committee in the Church of God outside of my local church I have forever I am forever indebted to John L. Byrd he's now with the Lord he lived to be almost a hundred just a few days before he died brother Byrd was district pastor of the urban North Carolina district that was my district where Smithfield was on that district and he believed enough to me to name me the Sunday school and youth director of the urban district when I was going to college six days a week and working eight hours a night seven days a week and there was R.P. Johnson, one of the great men of the Church of God, a great leader and a great preacher who was the overseer of North Carolina and who encouraged me to go to Vanderbilt for seminary work when at, a t at that time there was nobody in the whole Church of God who had ever been to a seminary. And there was M.P. Cross, the first executive mission secretary, who also encouraged me to go to Vanderbilt. Both of these fellows had sons who had gone to Vanderbilt to study electrical uh, engineering I mean uh, chemical engineering I think it was and they didn't know that have the least idea that the religion department was so bad that the Baptists wouldn't let their boys go there <laughs> I was appointed to Haiti in 1946 at the General Assembly in Birmingham Alabama under while uh, brother uh, what's his name was still the first uh, uh, secretary brother MP cross and then the next next secretary was Stuart Brinsfield he wrote a glowing letter introducing me to the missionaries in Haiti which I didn't see for 50 years until 50 years later but he had a, had a lot of uh, 
confidence in a young man like me. When I arrived in Haiti, I lived with the Clusets, and the life of Sister Stephanie Cecile Pierre Cluset had a great impact on my life. She was a very consecrated Christian woman, a powerful preacher, and a great motivator. And now I come to the most important person in my life, my wife, Virginia Arminda Green, or Jenny, as she was always called in her family. In 1946, she, when I was appointed to Haiti, she was appointed to Angola, along with Geneva Denson and the Stillwell family, Graham and Martha. They were going to continue the work begun by brother and sister Edwin and Pearl Stark, I went immediately to Haiti, but they were never able to get work, to work out the permits to go to Angola. The day after the Clusets left Haiti in March of 1947, I came down with mastoiditis. That's not a very common thing, so you may not know what it is. It's the mastoid bone back here looks like a, a, a sponge, but it's a bone and it gets infection and it's awfully, awfully painful. And when I came down with that, I was the only American Church of God personnel in Haiti. The Clusets had left, and I was the only missionary there. So I drove myself down to the general hospital, parked the car in the parking lot, and stayed a week. With no one to write mama and no one to write the board. So I concluded Jesus had a purpose in sending them out two by two. I needed to get married. <laughs> Virginia and I have been married now 50, 66 years. 66 years. August 7th. We're both committed for better or worse until death do us part. She has been a trooper. She is the candle of our home and the joy of my life. And when I am there alone, she is and she is away, things are not quite right. There is less light in the house. Scripture says that in marriage, the two become one. So what I am and what I have done, Virginia is part of it. I am James M. Beatty, Ph.D., because this lady, Virginia, taught classes in a middle school in Nashville, Tennessee, in order to put a roof over our heads and food on the table while I did my studies. So all, of all the people who have had input into my life, Virginia occupies a very special place. Thank you, Virginia, my love and my wife. Amen. Now, now let me conclude with an insight that I have begun to understand more and more with the years. What is the Christian life? What is Christian ministry? The secret is Christ in us. Christ in us. Christ in us. What is Christ? Christ is the anointed one. And he provides for the anointing too in the Holy Spirit. When I say Christ in us, I mean as he wills it and tends it for us. But what is important of Christ being in us? We might think of many things like to give us eternal life. Yes, that's part of it. Anyone who has Christ has eternal life. Or his presence is, is to, made to give, make us feel good. Well, partly because in his presence there is fullness of joy. But the real purpose of Christ in us, in you and in me, is so that he can continue to do his work of redemption in us and through us. What he works in us, Scripture calls the fruit of the Spirit. Note that the word is fruit in the singular, not plural. It's an integrated whole. We can't say, I want the love, I want the joy, I want the peace, but forget about, forget about that patient stuff. No, the whole is the likeness of Christ. And what he does through us is called the gifts of the Spirit. And then everything else we do 
He does it in us. I live not yet, not I, but Christ lives in me to do his will and to do his work. Therefore, what is done through us is not to our credit. Christ gets the glory. All that I have done and all that you have done has been Christ working through us. And so I have come to conclude that when we receive accolades about what we have done, we should hear them with the heart in appreciation. But we shouldn't let them go to our heads. Because all the glory goes to God and to his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Thank you and God bless each of you. Amen. In just a few moments, I hope that you will take the time to join us in the Bryant Fellowship Hall. It is uh, to your right. Uh, you can either go through this hallway or up the sidewalk, but we want to have a reception in honor of the babies, and we have some uh, delicious food. Please join us and uh, express your appreciation to them. Bear with me just a moment. Uh, you were given a card when you came in. Um, the lecture was free, the food is free, but God's called us at the Research Center to do a ministry to preserve that which has come before us, the photographs and the journals and the sermons and the boxes and the archival folders that we put those in aren't free. And uh, we are funded by the tithe fund, the Church of God tithe fund, and I am thankful for all of you who pay your tithes. Continue to do that. That will help us. Uh, but I'd like to give you an opportunity to help us in other ways tonight. Would you please do the kindness of letting us know you were here? Write your name on the card. Let us know you are present. The card gives you an opportunity to commit to pray for us. We need your prayers. Uh, we have a lot of work to do, and we need the strength and encouragement that comes from the prayers of the saints. Some of you may have some things that belong in our collection. A photograph, an artifact, a sermon. Dr. Beatty has bring, been bringing us things for quite some time now of his ministry and those others that he has been involved with and we are thankful for that. Some of you may want to do volunteer work at the Research Center. We have good volunteers like uh, Brother Sanford Hopkins who is here tonight and others in the room and we are appreciative of that. And then maybe some of you can help us financially. I've put in your program the fact that uh, tonight we're announcing that we're beginning to raise funds for the James Beatty collection. Uh, based on what he's given us up to this point, it's probably going to take about $2,000 for the boxes and the labor and that kind of thing. And, and, I'm, and I suspect he's got more at home that has yet to come to us. And so we'll believe for that as well. So I offer you an opportunity to stand alongside us and help us. Pray for us, donate, volunteer, pull out your checkbook. All of that will be greatly appreciated, and it's necessary. So thank you for coming tonight. Join us in showing appreciation to the Beatties in the Bryant Fellowship Hall, please. I've asked Dr. Daniela Augustine to pray our benediction, to offer thanksgiving and grace for our food and for our fellowship. Dr. Robock, thank you so very much for organizing this celebration of our heritage tonight. And uh, Dr. Moore, thank you for this uh, lecture that was more as a prayer, full of the groaning and the crying of the spirit uh, that summoned us once again in our calling in the world. And Hannah, thank you for this moving homily. Reminding us that even when we are ready to go of the promise, the promise would not let go.
of us. I have been blessed with wonderful elders. Many of them are here tonight. They were all faculty members of the Church of God School of Theology in those days, now the Pentecostal Theological Seminary. And at the time, Dr. Beatty was the dean when I arrived in January of 1992. Soon after that, um, faced a very deep cultural crisis. And in the midst of it, I found out he's the man in Cleveland, Tennessee, who knows more than, about Bulgaria than anyone else I have met. So he made me both homesick and very welcomed by talking with me for a long time about the beauty of the Balkan mountains, the wonderful Bulgarian yogurt, uh, and the stories about its miraculous uh, powers for giving us longevity, and uh, uh, the founder of the Bulgarian Church of God, who happened to be also the founder of the Argentinian Church of God. So yes, this made me feel more at home. And I'm very grateful uh, for all the mothers and fathers who soon surrounded me at the seminary, um, in addition to Dr. Beatty and Dr. Moore. Um, many of them are here tonight also. And I, I am very tempted to mention them all. <laughs> but definitely Dr. Len, Dr. Cheryl Jones, Dr. Chris Thomas, Dr. Leroy Martin, who respaced themselves to open a space for me in their world, which was the Academy of Pentecostal Theology, and strengthened my voice and made me the Pentecostal theologian that I am today. So thank you. Um, let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us a glorious heritage. For indeed, we stand upon the shoulders of giants luminous with the fires of Pentecost, who have faithfully walked in the spirit, not ashamed of their countercultural alien status, but have faced this world courageously as both its prophetic critique as well as its very embodiment of the future. Help us to follow in their footsteps, the footsteps of our fathers and mothers in the faith who have taught us an unquenchable passion for your kingdom and faithful witness of your redemptive omnipresence. Thank you also for granting us the gift of parenthood, the joy to see the spirit birthing forth sons and daughters of faith within the body of Christ. And we repent today as a community for taking this gift lightly on occasions, for not being always diligent stewards of the future of the church embodied in the lives of our spiritual children. Forgive us for competing with them instead of empowering and releasing them into ministry. Forgive us for not respacing ourselves on their behalf, but elbowing them out of the way in fear of our own ir irrelevance. Forgive us for muffling the voices of our prophesying daughters and devour, devouring, devaluing and crushing the visions of our visionary sons. Help us to see your coming to us in and through them and to not quench your spirit or expel your presence from our midst by disinheriting and dispossessing our children. Resynthesize us to your presence, we pray. Retune us into your voice. Help us to res res resonate with the groans of the Spirit for the revealing of your sons and daughters and for the healing of this world. Make us fruitful once again and give us all the children you want us to bear forth into your kingdom. Turn our hearts to the ones who you have already given us and their hearts to us, we pray. And bless tonight the remainder of our fellowship and the food that has been prepared to us may it become a time for a wonderful communion and celebration of your presence infusing our community. We pray for all that in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for coming. Uh, there are offering bags at the doors for your uh, cards and any gifts you might have. 
God bless you. Join us in the Bryant Fellowship Hall. Dr. Beatty, can we get a photo of you and Sister Beatty very quickly? Because people will want to talk to you. Is it possible?